We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up, up. Bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey Edwards and Will Washington. Have we recovered yet from Double or Nothing? I know it's been a bit. <laughs> Probably not. I, 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 look, I'm on the go. I have uh, not even gone home. We've had this California loop. I am currently sitting at a hotel in Los Angeles. And so, <laughs> yeah, I, I have not gotten a, to not only recover, I have not gone home. I will say Double or Nothing was was quite an experience. You know, this was not my first go around with Double or Nothing, but it was my first Double or Nothing at the MGM Grand. Oh, brother. This was the first one since the uh, original. It's such a different experience, right? It really is. Mainly because the MGM Grand Garden Arena is connected, obviously, to the MGM Grand Casino. And it's really the only venue you can truly work where in order to get anywhere, you have to go back to the casino. And in order to do so, you're going to run into a who's who of anybody. Literally anybody. (laughs) It's, It's just an interesting experience. And I can't speak highly enough of how well the MGM Grand Garden Arena treated us, just how cool of an environment the whole thing is. Um, But this was not your first go-around. As a matter of fact, I've been meaning to tell you, happy anniversary. Thank you. That was probably like one of my favorite things of Double or Nothing, is like most of the time people walk around and say like, oh, happy pay-per-view day, blah, blah, blah. And it's like something we could do nine times a year now, which is insane, the amount of growth we've had in these five years, right? But to have everyone wishing each other happy anniversary, specifically like the OG crew, when I first got in the ring and Justin Roberts was there in his like red drip, he just looks at me and goes, happy anniversary. I'm like, you too, man. Happy anniversary. It just felt really cool to have that history, right? Because we had double or nothing at the Grand Garden Arena. And then we had the pandemic. And then we had the pandemic, but with fans. And then we were at T-Mobile. So it's been interesting to kind of see the growth and change of Double or Nothing. I think it's the best pay-per-view to see sort of all of the the different phases of AEW. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we talk about AEW has changed a lot over the course of that time period. But I think like we as people have also changed a lot during the course of that time period. Like, for instance, I ran into Jericho backstage earlier on in the day. I said, happy anniversary said, happy anniversary. And he points at like the little lion statue backstage. He goes, I think the first time I met you was right there. I'm like, oh yeah, I was terrified. Because <laughs> we, did, we did not have the relationship we have now on that first day. I didn't work his match with him and Kenny. That was Paul. And it wasn't until All Out, the, the first time that we ended up working together. So of course, me with my one show contract, just trying to not like upset anybody. I'm like, hi, Mr. Jericho, sir. <laughs> like it completely different to what it was before. Talking to everybody throughout the day and uh, asking people about their first double or nothing experience, because everybody's first double or nothing experience is obviously their first AW experience. You know, talking with guys like Jerry Lynn, who struggled to remember what he even did on the first show. Right. <laughs> it's a, it was it was a blur, but it feels like also yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And I talked to Dean and just everybody. It, it was it was really cool. It's awesome to see where everybody is now and how that experience changed everybody and how it got the company started. The show itself was a hoot. Oh, brother. <laughs> what a we show. knew it would be. I'll say that hanging on to the the MJF stuff as, as long as we did, you know, it, it was fascinating because, I, you know, I always love reading internet rumors. And for the most part, I don't think anybody got their hands on that one. And so it was cool for a minute. And then all of a sudden throughout the day, you start hearing, I think a fan had like spotted him on his flight. Mm. You know, we, we were very smart about how we got him in. We weren't just going to fly him into Las Vegas. We flew him into a different state and then had him drive in. But apparently there was an AEW fan on, happened to be on that flight. And so that like, I, I, I was giving Max grief about it. I was like, you know what? You should have just driven, just Drive from uh, from New York, from, <laughs> Five from New days. York. Yeah, just do a whole. <laughs> you should just plan a whole road trip. Uh, so that was like the only thing that got out. But for the most part, we kept that one pretty well under wraps. I think it was a genuine, exciting surprise. I think the fans kind of knew once Adam Cole had come out. Yeah, you could kind of feel it in the air of what's about to happen here. Something is about to happen. Yeah. <laughs> And 
and the, the fans were started chanting his name and they could feel i don't think they knew but he, there was a sense of hope of is he about to be back i think he's about to be back I, I had a feeling as soon as I found out that Roddy and Will were the opener. I'm like, hmm. And looking at the format, like, why is this post-match so long? Hmm. <laughs> but, like, I don't know. That's one of the things I love about AEW is they keep the talent in the dark on yeah. the really, really cool stuff. The other one that comes to mind is, like, the Adam Copeland debut. None of us knew they were hiding in the building the whole time. And then all of a sudden, it's like he pops out at the end of Wrestle Dream, right? So, Max, it was very similar where we're all standing around in talent viewing, just looking at the TV like, is this going to happen? It's been like five months. Like, maybe? I don't know. And then his music hits after the little vignette thing. And I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. And in my head, I was talking to um, one of the Heels members the night before, and she had put together a double or nothing bingo card. And we were making jokes about what the free space should have been. Uh, Darby <laughs> Allen yeats himself <laughs> yeah. was one option. But one of them on the card was someone gets kicked in the yam bag. <laughs> and I was like, I have a feeling this is probably going to happen early. <laughs> and it did. <laughs> and it did. Poor Adam Cole. Hope he's okay. <laughs> yeah. Hope he's okay. I, I did talk to him a little bit afterward. I, I love Adam Cole. Uh, it, it is funny. I think that is a guy, especially after the podcast we recently did, that I can talk video games with till the end of time. and For hours. I actually hope two more. Yes. But yeah, Max has returned. MJF is back. And he's back in the fold. He's back in things. And it's exciting because there's been so much change in AEW since he's been gone. I think coming out of World's End... And coming out of Revolution, even, you know, thinking about the names that had all debuted, uh, we kind of had this trifecta of names and that, you know, the aforementioned Will Ospreay, the man who just became the international champion. Bro. And then also, by the time you're watching this, a very top contender. But uh, thinking about Will Ospreay and then thinking about we debuted Okada and then even Mercedes Monet, right? Like we've seen this trifecta of top names that have come into AEW, all of which are holding gold right now. All of that has happened since the last time we saw MJF. And so what does that mean for the landscape of the company as far as his return is concerned? Where does he fit? And and also, you know, Swerve Strickland was teetering on moving up. Like the kind of the last interaction we saw between Swerve and MJF was that backstage confrontation they had where Swerve Strickland literally told Max, you better stop waving that championship in front of my face. Now Swerve's the AEW world champion. And yep. uh, th there's just so much, there's so much potential for where Max fits into the AEW landscape that it's just really exciting to have him back. We're talking a little, a lot about, you know, something that happens in the first half hour, of the pay-per-view, but yes, I think it is impossible to talk about this pay-per-view unless we talk about the end of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anarchy in the arena is, is anarchy in the arena. So, so first off, I want to I wanna praise little thing. So we get the text in the morning from Paul. There's a nice ref group chat of all of the assignments, right? And that's our first entry point into like, here's the order of the day. And here's like what everyone's doing, all that sort of stuff. And I see the names of the refs next to Anarchy in the Arena. So this pay-per-view was Brandon Martinez and Mike Posey's first main event as referees. Wow. It's <laughs> I like that I blew your mind with a stat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Like, And thinking about the fact that the last couple of pay-per-views got to do that. Yeah. It's very cool. And, and seeing everybody on the ref squad get their opportunities. That's fun. That's very fun. It's a really, really cool one, right? And then being able to just do things like the first time, right? Anyway, let's let's keep talking about Anarchy in the Arena because there's so much and I don't want to like derail anyway. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Anarchy in the Arena was, was truly anarchy. Uh, I wanted to start by talking about the music. Yes. Because... Oh, this was so good. This was so good. <laughs> first off, first off, independent of the music, the fact that this is actually like a three-year payoff because three years ago at Anarchy in the Arena, John Moxley comes out last, and then his music just played through the arena yes. until Jericho took the soundboard and broke it. So last year, there was a similar thing. Yeah, we had Violent Idols playing um, Wild Thing last year. And then this year, it, we started with Darby's music. And then, by the way, that clip of Matthew and Nicholas uh, telling us how to improve this show. Oh, has, it's, it's burned into my brain. 
my mentions have not stopped on that one. Same. Uh, but, but yeah, Matthew and Nicholas then stopping it and starting their music. Obviously, look, I knew what was coming here, but I didn't necessarily know how the crowd was going to react, but I had hopes for exactly how it was going to go when Final Countdown began as soon as it hit. It's one of those songs that like most people know, but I think I'd say 80% of people who even know the song don't truly know it until the main melody kicks in. Honestly, all you need is that that line. The final. I don't want to sing it in case yeah. like it ends up costing us money. Um, <laughs> but everyone is familiar with it. You know, the song has like that gradual buildup, and like there was like this reaction. The song got itself three pops, right? Because it's got that initial buildup, and then the people who know that part are like, "Yeah, final countdown." And there's other people who are like, "What is this?" And then as soon as it hits the do 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 do, everybody, then there's this giant pop, and then again, the the last one is for the lyric of the final countdown. It, it was a great moment to the point of where the fans start chanting, "We want music." Once Matt has it shut down, um, I thought Matt was was a plus in this match. <laughs> I thought he was probably the unsung hero of the entire thing. His presence was was great there. But honestly, you know, thinking about the idea of having Darby Allen in Anarchy in the Arena for the first time ever, there was all these questions of what could that possibly mean? And what could that mean? We'll talk about it after the break. AEW Unrestricted, it's Aubrey and Will. We're talking about anarchy in the arena. And again, I was uh, just getting into the Darby. <laughs> I hope you could just say Darby and we're like, oh my God. <laughs> and this is like a Randall and Clerks thing, right? Because he wasn't even supposed to be here. Uh, and <laughs> he got added to it. And in getting added to it, it added the questions of what was he going to do here? Because we already know Darby is... Just the way he thinks, the way he operates, the way he plans. We knew he had something crazy in mind to actually see it get executed. Insane. Insane. Well, and it wasn't just like one spot. It was multiple. It was being run over by a truck. It was lighting Jack Perry on fire. <laughs> yeah. You know, the the bus is an interesting story. Oh, can we talk about this? Because. I mean, it's, so the funny thing is, I don't know. I, I will let Jack Perry one day tell the story of how he got a bus. How the bus got to MGM Grand. <laughs> yeah, how the bus got to MGM Grand. But that legitimately is a bus that Jack Perry owns. Yep. The scapegoat bus is actually his. That is not an AEW prop. And I don't think we got a good enough shot of the blood on the front, which is symbolic of the bus that ran over Darby. Yep. Again, just having the bus in the match itself but also as you mentioned jack perry got set on fire which is just like wild right fun backstage story so when we do crazy stuff we take all of the necessary precautions and the amount of people we had running around to make sure that we were safe all day was as someone who is caring about my coworkers, extremely like putting us at ease one of the things we had to have is apparently it's a Nevada state law. <laughs> I don't know if it's specifically when you light someone on fire, but we have to have multiple fire extinguishers on handing just in case something goes wrong. Sure. We were told, hey, these fire extinguishers, these ones over here, these are chemical. Please do not use them. If we do, we might have to shut the show down. And it was just like, oh God. And I immediately panic because I've got the FTW match. <laughs> <laughs> which anything could happen, right? Right. So I immediately walk over to the guys. And we're calling the match. And I walk in, I'm like, quick announcement. If you see fire extinguishers, please do not use them. And they're like, oh, okay, okay. And I've, I'm nervous because now I'm letting them know that it's there. And that's the worst thing you can do with wrestlers is let them know a prop is there <laughs> because it means they're going to use it. I say, no, no, no. This could stop our show if you use this. And they're like, oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. And it's like, thank you. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> So I had this like panic in the back of my mind just the whole day of, please nobody use these. Also, not knowing what they were going to be used for or what the safety precaution was. And I'm just like, why are these here? Why are we even concerned about this? So the Jack Perry thing became even a bigger deal by the time it actually happened. I'm sitting in catering watching this match. I still have my audio equipment in. And all of this stuff is happening with the Bucks on stage. And I hear someone say, all right, we're almost ready with Jack. 
And I'm just like, oh, no, what is about to happen? <laughs> oh, no. Again, this is one of those things that, like, obviously I had known about. But until you can see, it's even better knowing about it and knowing about it as long as you've known about it. But you can't picture it and you can't actually see how this is going to go down and how it could possibly go down. And then it went down and mm. Jack Perry was literally set on fire. Yep. I was extremely concerned about him. Who wasn't, right? Like, even though he's a bit of a jerk right now, who's not concerned when you light a coworker on fire? Well, the hard part for everybody, I think, in the weeks leading up, everybody said the same thing the second they heard about it, which was, God, man, watch out for Jack's hair. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about that till now. Oh, my God. Like, everybody had that same thing of, oh, but Jack, his hair. That's the thing you know Jack Perry for. Oh, my God. But either way, Darby is a madman and hit Darby with the, I mean, he hit Jack with the flamethrower. That wasn't even the craziest thing he did because then he got hung upside down like 10 minutes later. <laughs> well, I was going to say uh, really quick on the topic of the fire. The other concern mm -hmm. was our boss being <laughs> within nearby. Five feet, yes, within five feet of these flames. And luckily, Tony got out of harm's way. And thankfully. He, he got out of the way in order for the flames to hit Jack the way that they should have. And again, Anarchy in the Arena finds a way every single year to, as a matter of fact, just thinking about, as I said that out loud, I'm thinking about one of the most iconic images of the history of Anarchy in the Arena is somebody not getting set on fire, right? It was Eddie Kingston coming out with the gas can. Yes. And he was about to light Jericho on fire. And Brian Danielson stopped him from doing so. And... We come full circle two years later. Jack Perry actually gets set on fire. It's like we paid off one of the, the longest term right? pieces of Anarchy in the Arena. There was so much payoff in this match, independent <laughs> of like it being absolutely crazy, right? Yeah. So Darby goes from lighting Jack on fire to eventually getting hung upside down. He's hung upside down by his ankles, uh, one of which he has hurt recently. And then he's upside down having recently had a broken nose <laughs> and then he's gonna kicked in the face with tack shoes yeah i had a my sister joke she's like one day darby's gonna die of something really really boring <laughs> 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 like, yeah that would exactly be the the proper way for darby to go right? out that would be the obituary we read about darby ellen <laughs> yeah uh what was interesting too was the fans we talked about you know, they, they chanted, we want music when the music got shut off. <laughs> when they saw the, the double or nothing chips, they start chanting, use the chips. And uh, <laughs> they got the payoff to that spot. They, they were, I think, uh, the fans brought a little bit of magic the whole mm -hmm. night. And I just, I appreciated their participation in this match. And of course, Matthew Nicholas, uh, a couple of weeks ago on this show, gave us some hints as to what they were going to do with the shoes. Mm -hmm. And they they introduce their Reebok pumps into the ring, which which they then literally pump up in the ring. Yes, I'm mm -hmm. dying because <laughs> you have this very serious moment. You have to make sure you got the good fit, <laughs> right? <laughs> also, the fact that their robes matched the shoes that they were releasing, which was like our our merch team was over the moon. By the way, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't get a product placement better than that. <laughs> One of the things I was also very happy with was Kazuchika Okada doing this match in wrestling gear. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody is is prepared for a street fight and Okada being one of the greatest of all time is like, no, I am in wrestling gear. I am here to have a match and I am going to have one regardless of the circumstances of said match. Uh, in my mind, I'm like, I just feel like he didn't get the memo and showed up one day and just went, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like he didn't know what he was getting into, right? Like he didn't prepare. And, and that, of course, was one of our three main events. <clears throat> I have to say, I, I loved how in to the idea of the triple main event, the crowd ended up being. It mm -hmm. felt like a great reset for the show. Like the moment the graphic hit and you saw the three main event slots hit and then there was just like this excitement in the building. I went out into the crowd right before the start of Willow and Mercedes. I kind of knew how the fans were going to take that match. Uh, I'd say, I'd say I like called 95% of 
the crowd reaction to that match. And then I thought they killed it. Oh, absolutely. Shout out to uh, some really great entrances. You know, there was a theme of this show. I wanted to say this at the top of the show, but there was a theme to this show. And the theme to this show was bet on yourself. You know, we heard it from Max. We heard it from Mercedes. Uh, and we later heard it from Swerve. And it just became a very consistent theme of this show because we had uh, multiple people who really took a chance in coming to AEW. And they bet on themselves and it paid off in such an incredible way. And I think Double or Nothing was the perfect place to showcase that. Mercedes had uh, a very cool entrance. She had the drum line with her, with her theme music. Then for Willow to enter with the giant friendship bracelet. Can I talk about how this came to be? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely talk about how this came to be because I was hoping that you did have the story because yes. I, I was with Willow when she received it. Oh my God. I think your reaction was the best to all of this. Okay, so so here's what happens. So the day before a collision, we had set up uh, an AEW heels booth to kind of, kind of help promote what the organization is. But then we also had, because we've been running for years now, we sort of had a designated time where I had posted to the site like, hey, if you're a Heels member, please come by around four o'clock so that we can get a group photo because we had a party later that night, but I knew not everyone was going to be there and it was just really fun. And we had this one fan come up and she she made a bunch of friendship bracelets, like just the standard standard friendship bracelet. She made some like keychains. And then she goes, I have something for Willow and I'm hoping I see her today. And she pulls out this friendship bracelet that's literally like the size of a hula hoop yeah. and my eyes light up and i go you're so so i know you're hoping to see willow but like i literally am going to see willow in like the next 10 minutes i can get this to her and she goes are you sure i'm like i will make this happen <laughs> because i'm losing my mind at how cool this thing is so i like put it on, wrap it around my head multiple times because I'm trying to not let it drag on the ground. And I walk through the arena since it's the quickest way to do it. I'm just like, hi, hi, sorry, late for work, late for work, late for work. <laughs> I walk in the back, Willow's in makeup. You're standing there next to her. I walk up and go, hey, Willow, I have a present for you. And that's all I say. <laughs> and I pull this thing off and your face was like a frigging kid on Christmas where your eyes light up and you go, you have to wear this on TV. It was like the first thing you said. Yeah. And I think Willow's just in shock that this thing exists, right? It was so cool to see her incorporate this thing into her entrance because Willow has been such a huge fan favorite. And that became very clear during the pay-per-view. Mercedes is this huge star, but she's getting booed. And I don't think it's because people dislike her. I think it's because everyone is so behind Willow. She's been making friendship bracelets and handing them out to the crowd. So it's just one of those like symbolic things of, we all feel like Willow is our friend. Yeah. And this match was insane. And I, I was a part of it. And I will really quickly say that, uh, again, just pulling back the curtain. Yes. As soon as Willow got it, she's like, I, I want this in my entrance. You know, this yep. is, is going to be a cool thing. And uh, I think it'll help make my entrance special. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, you know, the, with the big show like Double or Nothing, everybody's got nerves. And so one of the places that you have nerves is that you tend to forget things. And so as we are getting ready for this match, and I said that I was with both Mercedes and Willow right before the match, before everybody goes out, it hit me. I go, where's the bracelet? And Willow's like, Oh shit. Uh, it's just like, <laughs> I, I need that. And she ended up sending, um, Chris Statlander ends up running and going to get it from the locker room. And so luckily had I not said anything that might not have made it onto TV, right? but it did. And she was so happy to get to, to showcase that shout out to the fan who made it. That that's such yeah. a really cool thing. And also it represents why heels is so important to get to mm -hmm. have that type of interaction and to get to, to present that kind of thing to the talent. I, it was just a really cool moment. And I was really happy that that got to be a part of the show. On that topic, I want to talk about Chris Stantlander, but we're going to have to talk to Chris, let's talk about Chris Stantlander after the break. Unrestricted, Aubrey, Will, we are talking about the craziness that was Double or Nothing, the five-year anniversary of AEW. We're sharing backstage stories, we're sharing the stuff that you saw on the screen, and before the break, we were talking about sort of the prep to the TBS title match, but I want to talk about what happened after, because I think that was shocking. 
to literally everybody, including myself, because Chris Statlander has been a huge, I don't know what the right word is, but she's been just this huge part of AEW since she came on during the pandemic. And to see her growth and her comeback multiple times and how Double or Nothing was a huge part of her career last year with her big return and her winning the TBS title. Chris Statlander is the person that I think we have all rooted for in the same way that we have rooted for Willow. So to see her turn on Willow the way she did, I was heartbroken. I was talking to Chris after said match. It was a moment that I think everyone was extremely nervous about because of everything you mentioned. You know, she's been around since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. She was somebody that everybody was rooting for. Uh, you know, I think about even, you know, you mentioned the pandemic. I even think about pre-pandemic. And I remember when she she faced Riho at a Dynamite. Yeah. I remember, you know, Riho was such a fan favorite, but Chris had kind of this organic uprising. I remember just how upset fans were that Riho had retained the women's title over Chris Statlander because even then people wanted to see that happen for her. I knew she was entering uncharted territory as soon as she attacked our dear friend, Willow Nightingale. Ugh. I just looked at her and I went, you have not drawn the ire of AEW fans yet because the one thing AEW fans have a loyalty to is I think a lot of the AEW originals. Mm -hmm. That's just kind of something AEW fans really gravitate toward, but they also have a loyalty to Willow Nightingale. <laughs> <laughs> I think one supersedes the other and Chris and Stokely betraying willow the way they did i don't even think she has an experience in being like mean to fans and so i am very excited to see how this plays out i'm excited to see it but at the same time i'm sad like i've lost such a close positive friend <laughs> i know but also she's got a, a some legitimate gripes and some issues that i think you know, she she stood in the background to Willow Nightingale for quite some time, mm -hmm. having to now step forward, step out of the shadows, and also reveal that, you know, she is also kind of pulling some strings along the way for quite some time, that uh, this yeah. wasn't one of those things that just happened in the moment. This is a really cool opportunity for her. I think this is a really cool moment for the women's division in getting to tell more stories. And so I, all, all in all, I think this just ended up being really cool, but also talking about the match itself and you getting to be in there oh for that match. God. Mercedes obviously had a lot to prove. I think that the longer she went in AEW without having a match, the more the fans had questions. Mm -hmm. I think she answered all those questions and then some and reminded people that she is one of the best wrestlers in the world, that she is one of the greatest of all time. To get to be doing what she does best in AEW was very cool. I think history is going to be really kind to Willow Nightingale's reign as TBS champion when you think about how short that reign was. But in that reign, she got to have more face time than anybody has had as TBS champion. She was controlling the microphone. She was having contract signing. She was defending the title overseas. She was having main events in Manitoba massacres. To get to have done all of that in a month, she won the title April mm -hmm. 21st and lost the title May 26th. So in six weeks. Wild. What she got to accomplish as TBS champion. I think history is going to look back on that reign very positively and how much it leveled up the championship to the point of where it was literally one of three main events mm -hmm. to hear the excitement, to hear how, you know, we did, uh, we had Justin Roberts doing the old school style intros and hearing how just excited fans were for that opening bell. I think we did a lot of good with the TPS championship over that last month and for it to culminate in this match. It was great. But seeing you in there, too, for that moment, I thought was really cool. I don't think there's ever been a female referee for a women's main event in a pay-per-view. So that wasn't lost on me. The amount of respect I have for Mercedes, because she had changed the way that I viewed wrestling way back in 2015, where from a representation standpoint, I had not really felt like there was a place for me as a fan and all of a sudden I feel 100% represented in the ring. It was wild. So to be a part of that match was insane. I remember they were doing the rehearsal for uh, the drum bots and the showgirls and I started to like feel the, ar the, the hair on my arms kind of stand up. I'm like, I need to walk away or I'm going to cry and my makeup's done. Like, <laughs> 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 So holding it together the whole day, when I got to the back, 
you thank everybody, you make sure everyone's okay, that everyone's healthy. And I look at Willow and go, can I hug you? And she goes, yes, please. And I hug her and I just start bawling. It was an emotional match, I think, for everyone involved. It was an emotional match for the fans just because of what it meant and all of the questions going into it. But it was a really, really good match. Yes. Which I think is ultimately the thing that all of us are the most proud of coming out of that, is that it was freaking 18 minutes of pure amazingness. Longest women's match in AEW history, by the way. Correct. A lot of, a lot of history was made that day. And uh, we're all really happy about it. But it wasn't, we've talked about two of the three main events. We have to talk about the third. Yes, uh, which was for the AEW World Championship. Swerve Strickland in his first pay-per-view title defense uh, defended the title against Christian Cage. Ugh. Christian Cage, of course, accompanied by the patriarchy. I, I wanted to talk about Nana's return the week prior, <laughs> sipping the coffee, as he, the coffee as he pulled in front of Christian. I thought that was such a cool moment. In so many different ways. I think the fans having that reaction to Nana's return felt really good. Yeah. Especially knowing where Nana's come from. Knowing Prince Nana having been a part of wrestling for the last 23 years. Yes. Knowing that he's made it to this level. And hearing that he is such a fan favorite now. To the point of where I, I said all that to say that we get to this match. They did the uh, the Warriors entrance and Swerve with the really cool Warriors gear. When Paul ejects Nana in this match, <laughs> how upset the fans got. <laughs> Paul becomes the biggest heel in wrestling. <laughs> yeah, I could not believe. I think, honestly, those might have been the loudest boos of the night. And that says something considering how much was on this show. But hearing the fans just upset that Nana was ejected from the match was actually really cool because... You know, he's been a manager for so long. And getting ejected is such an honor as a manager, right? <laughs> such <laughs> that's a how badge you know of honor. <laughs> yeah, that's how you know you've made it. And you've gotten to do it so many times. But, you know, it's usually such a big pop. And to now have reached the point in Nana's career where getting ejected is not strange to him. No. Getting ejected and the fans being furious over it is such a full circle moment for his career. And I just loved getting to see that. I had immediately hoped as soon as it happened, I was like, okay, no, 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 no. This cannot be it. We we need to make sure <laughs> that Paul gets some cheers. <laughs> yes. So to eventually see the patriarchy ejected kind of made, made it all a little bit better. <laughs> yes, it did. Uh, the genius of that moment of, getting it back and the crowd getting excited over that was a really cool moment that really showcased who was at ringside and let them have a little bit of shine and then allowed us to put it back on Swerve and Christian, who I thought had an excellent match. Probably my favorite match of the night, honestly. I think that Christian is such a master at building tension in a match and building you into it and uh, by the time, you know, you hit the climax of the match, you know, you are on the edge of your seat. There's few people who are better at that craft than Christian Cage is. So good. But at the same time, uh, you want to talk about somebody who is a master at their craft and swerve. You know, one of the things people have always put over with swerve is his precision. Mm -hmm. He is so crisp and so clean at what he does. Of course, there's now a picture that's become very iconic of him hitting that house call in reverse to Christian's spear attempt, that kick to the side of Christian's head, and how exactly precise that foot is. Shout out to our amazing photographers for catching that moment. And like that's such an iconic shot. You could put that on the cover of literally anything and... I feel like you could sell it as AEW's top 10 greatest moments. You could sit, put that on the front of it. You could put that on a video game cover. You could put that on a trading card. There's so much you could do with that image. To have somebody who's as excellent at their craft physically as Swerve is, and to have him be our world champion. I'm so happy. He's still got a lot more to go, but it was so cool to get to see him have that first world title defense. It's such a special event for Swerve. I, I talked to him earlier in the day about how uh, his first Double or Nothing experience was the three-way, which was him and Keith versus Jurassic Express 
versus what a time team Taz. Uh, it was Ricky Starks <laughs> and powerhouse Hobbs. What? <laughs> I know. Right. It was a three way tag. Uh, that was his first double to nothing experience. And he mentioned how meeting Floyd Mayweather in Vegas for the first time. And they had really hit it off and he had invited Floyd to double or nothing. Floyd said he'd come check out AEW and that it seemed really cool. And he told Swerve that, you know what? I'll come check it out when you're on top. <gasps> That's cool. To bring that full circle in this match, I, the fans all noticed that Floyd Bayweather was at ringside mm -hmm. cheering on Swerve. And, you know, Swerve went over there, recognized him, and they had their moment. To see that come full circle two years later, he, you know, Swerve mentioned this in the, the press scrum about how he had, he had been working on this for two years and he got Floyd to check out AEW and Floyd was blown away at, you know, where this company is today. And, mm -hmm. and so to see that happen, I thought was also a really cool moment. There was just so much cool shit that happened on the show. It's, it's hard to describe how high the energy was from the moment the crowd all came in, but I knew it at collision and collision the night before I could feel this energy in the air. And then when they got in for double or nothing, it was just high from beginning to end. And just shout out to every fan who lives in Vegas, who traveled to Vegas. You guys were incredible. There were so many moments that had amazing fan reactions that we didn't even get to touch on in this. There was the return of Juice Robinson. There was Adam Copeland coming out to the brood entrance and Gangrel coming through the floor. Yes. We could do a whole podcast just talking about that, right? One of my favorite fan reactions was how the crowd really supported Brian after we went off the air yes. to see Brian in the ring, you know, for what he's meant for AEW in his time at the company and knowing that this is his last year as a full-time wrestler, like this is his last double or nothing as a full-time wrestler. And I think it kind of all dawned on that on us after that moment when team AEW loses anarchy in the arena. And I think we all immediately are just like, Oh, yeah. but Brian. <laughs> I know Brian has had a string of high profile losses this year. He lost to Eddie Kingston at Revolution. He lost to Will Ospreay at Dynasty. He lost this match here for Team AEW. As fans of Brian Danielson, that's that's not the way you want to see his final year ha uh, go out. And, nope. and I think the fans recognize that they're running out of these Brian Danielson moments. So for him to have that moment off air after the show was was still really cool. And God, man, just thinking about this being Brian Danielson's final year. Right. I don't want that moment to come, but we know it is. The experience that Double or Nothing is for the fans. To be in the crowd when you have wrestlers fighting in front of your face for anarchy in the arena. To be a part of these historic moments. To see all of the crazy stuff that our performers can pull off. And to have that... There's something about the emotion behind wrestling that you can only feel alive. Yes, you can watch it on screen and be a part of it, but there's nothing like being there live. If you have not made your way out to AEW pay-per-view, like, what are you waiting for? Absolutely. <laughs> this is such a great experience. Such a great experience. And this has been uh, a great experience with you on this show, getting to talk about this, getting to, to recap this. We love all of you AEW fans, and we hope to see you at the next show. Um, because we've got Forbidden Door coming up. Oh, got right around the corner. <laughs> right around the corner. Um, so definitely, if you haven't gotten to come to an AEW show, please, AEWTix.com is the way to be a part of it. And the way to continue to check out this show is on all of your favorite podcast platforms because AEW Unrestricted is available every Thursday on all your favorite podcast platforms. We've got video editions if you want to look at these mugs and see me in a hotel lobby. See us both looking exhausted. Yes, uh, you can check that out on our YouTube channel. You can check out AEW Dynamite, new episodes every Wednesday. We've got AEW Rampage every Friday on TNT. Dynamite on TBS, by the way. We've got AEW Collision every Saturday on TNT. We've got Ring of Honor available on Honor Club every Thursday. We're all over the place. Yes, there's so much wrestling. You can watch your wrestling. Watch it your way. AEW is still always going to be where the best wrestle. And we love you. Continue to check out AEW Unrestricted. We'll be back next week. Peace. Come on, throw your hands up, let me see you. Unrestricted, got the house now. We gon' turn it up, up, bring the house down. Got that big space. Bro.
pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. 